Good morning, everybody. It is Monday, July 17th. Welcome to the Council and the Transportation and Environment Committee. Uh, we have three items on our agenda today. First, the Rustic Roads Master Plan, then the Rustic Roads Advisory Committee, and then the uh, Green Bank Fuel Energy Tax Legislation. So we are going to start with the Rustic Roads uh, Master Plan. Um, do any of my colleagues have any comments? Councilman Balcom, anything you want to say in the beginning? I have a long, nope. a long list. So. Uh, a long <laughs> list. So we'll just get started and you'll, you'll jump in as, as, uh, as you'd like. Uh, Dr. Orland, we'll start with you. Uh, good morning. Um, what you have before you is the first comprehensive update to the Rustic Roads Master Plan uh, in 27 years. Uh, last one was 1996. Um, we have with us today, um, you go with, I'll introduce yourselves. Sure, Patrick Butler, Butler the Up County Planning Division from the Planning Department. Uh, Jamie Pratt, uh, co lead of the Master Plan. Uh, Roberto Duke, uh, co lead on the Master Plan. Don Ziegler, Up County Master Plan Supervisor. And Tanya Stern, Acting Planning Director. And I also just wanted to note that we are joined by Planning Board Chair Artie Harris uh, in the audience. There he is. <laughs> I didn't see him. Uh, good to see you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good morning, Tim Couples, uh, Chief of Division of Transportation and Engineering, Montgomery County DOT. Okay, thank you very much. Um, the master plan does several, makes several references to parts of the program. Uh, the piece of it which really is actionable is the uh, classification of these roads. What roads are classified as rustic roads or should be classified as rustic roads or exceptional rustic roads. Uh, we're talking about the extent of those roads. Should the extent uh, be larger or smaller? Um, should the significant features which are required to be uh, to, to make a rustic road or rustic, exceptional rustic road eligible should those change and should there be any rustic or exceptional rustic roads so currently classified as that be declassified to to another uh, another source um, uh, there's quite a bit of comments we've received about maintenance so we'll be talking about that today uh, although really uh, what's act the way to uh, make changes there really is not in the master plan uh, I mean, the plan makes less several recommendations, which of course is fine, but to actually make a difference in terms of the maintenance, uh, there are two things. One is the um, uh, executive regulations which cover maintenance for rustic and exceptional rustic roads, and probably more importantly is the budget itself, the operating budget, and, say, and the capital budget, and we will talk about those later. Um, uh, and then the other uh, issue that was raised uh, in the master plan was the composition and purposes of the Rustic Roads Advisory Committee. Uh, I encourage the planning board uh, subsequently to actually send a bill to us because that's the only way that can actually change. It can't change in the, uh, in the master plan itself by just changing the master plan itself. They've done that. That's the next agenda item. Um, so as a result of that, my first recommendation really is to take out of the master plan the references having to do with the purposes and composition because they'll be out of date at the same time this plan actually gets approved and even if you end up um, incorporating in the master plan what you decide on bill 3023 uh, there's always the possibility maybe even the likelihood that uh, either this or a future council will want to change the composition and purposes again before the master plan is updated again another 27 years so i recommend taking that that language out and so it's my first First recommendation. I, I think that makes sense. Okay. We all do. All right. Uh, th so the major issue uh, in terms of the plan is the reclassification of the roads. On page two, uh, you see what the uh, the criteria for rustic and exceptional rustic roads are, um, and and most of um, actually uh, what is in the plan, uh, there is no disagreement on. In fact, just a if I the, the point of per personal privilege, uh, I've been working on master plans here for 33 years and prior to that it was DOT reviewing plans. I've never seen a plan better organized or better presented than this one. This is a fabulous plan. Uh, particularly the documentation of the uh, in volume two of the um, uh, of the significant features in the road profile. So just kudos to, to the planning department for that. Uh, so the first issue is um, has to do with Batchers Forest Road. Um, uh, it's a rustic road over its entire length. If you go to volume two um, it's um, the the map on page 20 uh, shows the um, shows the extent of the road and the significant features along it. Um, currently, it runs all the way from Georgia Avenue on the 
uh, southwest side up to Dr. Bird Road and Olney on the north side. Uh, the plan recommends declassifying uh, the this, this short section from Georgia Avenue uh, over to um, the, um, uh, the Harvest in Intercontinental Church and an entrance to only Manor uh, Recreational Park given that there is more traffic there and it's not particularly rustic. Um, and, uh, um, and so there's no disagreement with that. Uh, DOT has made the comment that there should be other sections looked at along uh, Batchers Forest Road uh, to be declassified because of uh, volume of traffic, because of um, uh, that there's development, uh, residential development along it. Um, and we also have a, um, a letter from uh, Council Member uh, Lutke, which uh, I hope if you, if, you have, if you don't have them before you, I've made extra copies, um, but if you have them, uh, which uh, basically uh, requests that at least a certain section of uh, Bachelors Forest Road be looked at again. Or, and, and in talking with her, she's specifically uh, interested in the area between Dr. Bird and where Old Vic Boulevard intersects at Farquhar Middle School. Um, that section actually does have rustic features along it. Uh, it is a narrow road, um, and however, it is it is used by um, school buses coming from the east, from Ashton, Sandy Spring, come in usually on Doctor on um, on Batches Forest Road. And even though Old Vic Boulevard is a modern street, and you can go directly from Old Vic into Farquhar without having to use Batches Forest, you have to go further west to, to get to that. And oftentimes in the morning, when schools um, times uh, folks are, uh, school buses are arriving uh, traffic backs up towards the east um, and so uh, this is one of the areas where I think she was thinking that perhaps uh, uh, it deserves another look um, uh, my recommendation is to basically concur with the final draft leave the whole thing as a uh, from uh, 1200 feet east of Georgia Avenue all the way up to Dr. Bird as a rustic road there are uh, measures you can take to make uh, Batches Forest Road slower or safer even than what it is now, for example, and the complete streets bill that you passed uh, earlier this year, um, or was late last year, don't recall now, uh, you were allowed for speed humps uh, on rustic roads. And so if speed were an issue in that section, speed humps could be put in place. Um, and there is the alternative of Old Vic Boulevard that should, um, should it ever be a real issue um, for school buses to arrive. So um, I would I recommend basically concurring with the final draft on, on this. And I should say that the um, residential development that's along Bachelors Forest Road, most of it is off the road. In other words, there's a, a small road that uh, maybe uh, feeds a small subdivision. The subdivision itself has modern suburban streets, suburban type streets, but it, it doesn't uh, uh, cause any changes to Bachelors Forest Road itself. Councilman Balcom. Thank you. Um, can we hear from DOT as to what your thoughts are about what other what other pieces should be uh, removed? Well, I think we just wanted to make sure that there was, um, you know, a, a good discussion of the features and the development that has occurred around in the location of the, of the middle school, um, you know, for the purposes of this discussion. So that, that's kind of, we, we didn't make a specific recommendation in our letter. We just said we want to make sure this discussion was occurred. I think the executive branch, if the decision is, you know, just the 1,200 feet by George, Georgia Avenue that is the outcome of this, we, we don't oppose that. But we just want to make sure that, you know, we're taking a complete look at uh, the features. And I think Glenn did, a, did an adequate, uh, more than adequate job of uh, describing uh, the, the it's a balancing act that mm -hmm. we're trying to achieve on any of these roads. So, my con thank you. Um, the concern about this road for me is that at the at what point, if we find that the the school traffic increases, I understand the possibility of a speed hump doesn't necessarily go well with the buses. Um, but at what point um, could could this come back up as a possibility of coming out? Um, the only way you can change the classification is through a master plan amendment. Mm -hmm. So it's either in a uh, special amendment for this particular road or for the next comprehensive update, which is probably going to be a very long time, or uh, the next update of the uh, of the Olney plan, for example. I'm mm -hmm. not sure, I don't know when that's scheduled, but uh, whenever an area master plan is um, is updated, 
one of the things that's updated is the road classifications in those areas if necessary. So that's another opportunity. I don't know when Olney is scheduled, uh, or if it is. It, go ahead. Yeah, uh, only is not scheduled right now. Um, it, you know, there are some recommendations uh, for some historic uh, language and other more frequent uh, cleanup, uh, uh, you know, keeping the plan tidy, that, that sort of uh, thing that we've recommended in this plan. So uh, we're hoping that we don't come back to you in 20 or 30 years, that it's a little more frequent than that. And we can evaluate as roads change, you know, et cetera. Trying not to do an entire comprehensive uh, amendment, but if there are some smaller cleanup items, we're this would, could be something that we look at. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, you might want to ask. A, I mean, the planning staff or planning board may want to talk about why they made this recommendation um, in the first place. I'm, I guess. I'm good. Yeah, I, I think we're okay, oh, okay. with with uh, staff recommendation and the district council members' recommendation as well. Okay. So without objection. Um, the next item is Frederick Road. This is uh, Route 355, but it's only the section through the Hyattstown Historic District from where Old Hundred Road Route 109 intersects with it at the south end of the Historic District up to the county line, Frederick County line. Um, uh, it has been classified as a rustic road uh, since 1994. Um, it is entirely within the Historic District. Uh, there's really not much change that's likely to happen there. The fact, the only thing that's really happened there in the last several years is the county built a, uh, a sidewalk uh, through that area about, I don't know, about six or seven years ago or more. Um, and, uh, but within the, the guidance from the historic district. Um, it's not rustic, it's going through a town, effectively a small village, um, and uh, it's a state highway, so uh, it doesn't have, uh, there's no, nothing that the county can do uh, to this road uh, because it's a state maintained and uh, uh, it's a state highway. We don't have any authority over it. So my recommendation is to uh, declassify this as a rustic road and classify it as a country connector, which is the classification of 355 just south of there uh, heading towards Clarksburg. I, I agree with that and uh, having uh, driven uh, on that stretch very recently going up uh, to Frederick County. Um, the nature of that area has changed and a lot of people are using that to, to come on south or to go up north and uh, I concur with the recommendation. Mm -hmm. We're good? Yep. Okay. Okay. Uh, the next two are, have as a pair because in the same area, in Sandy Spring area, uh, Meeting House Road and Bentley Road. Um, Bentley Road runs north uh, from Route 108, Meeting House Road runs south, Bentley Road is a rustic road. Meeting House Road is a exceptional rustic road, um, and the um, uh, if, if you, let's take up Bentley Road first. Uh, it is on. Uh, I'm sorry. Its map is on page 35 of Volume Two, um, and uh, the comment from DOT is that the first 500 feet, literally about one tenth of a mile of it, as you leave 108. Um, should not be a rustic road in that it's the entrance point to Sandy Spring Museum. So there's, in effect, regional traffic going to that location, but the rest of it would be remaining a rustic road. In the case of Meeting House Road, um, which is on, uh, and I put clips on these things so I can find it quickly, but two here we go. Right, the map is on page uh, 208. Um, again, in this case, the first 500 feet of it south of 108 in this case, um, which is entirely within the um, Sandy Spring Historic District, um, but not the whole historic district, actually just a small piece of it, actually uh, runs by sort of an industrial commercial entity. It's not at all rustic, um, uh, but beyond that point, um, uh, DOT is recommending retaining that as a an exceptional rustic road. In both cases, the, the little pieces, the 500 long, foot long pieces of Bentley and Meeting House we're talking about would be reclassified to a country road. And I concur with that. Yep. We agree? Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, excuse thank you. Um, ahead, Jamie. I, I was looking at this uh, to figure out, you know, the 500 feet seemed uh, too neat and tidy. So, um, it's actually for Bentley Road. It's more like 265 feet, and for um, 
uh, meeting house, there was a section about 310 feet. So I, I had some just slight modifications to the suggested language that for Bentley Road, the entry drive to the Sandy Spring Museum be the southern extent of that road instead of that 500 feet. And for Meeting House Road, there's um, a little parking lot behind a retail building that used to be a firehouse. And so I was saying the back edge of that parking lot essentially would be where the exceptional rustic segment begins. Um, okay. I don't have a, a visual to show you, but... That's the, the parking lot that's across from the Friends Meeting House. Um, no, 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 I'm no, sorry, this is on the other on the other road. On, on, the other um, road. Oh, on okay. Meeting House Road, there's um, a new adaptive reuse of a historic looking building yeah. that's there. It's, it's across from that. There's a parking lot behind the, the it's bakery. It's bakery. bakery. It's, uh, and, and, yep. and so there's a parking yeah, lot yeah. there that has dumpsters and, and, and the parking lot is actually the pavement. It, it goes up to the road. There's no separation of the road and parking lot there. So I was just saying just past there is where I would think would be the logical spot to okay. draw the line of where it's rustic and not. I, I would concur with what Jamie's saying about Bentley Road. Just show it just up to the entrance. That was the that was the intent. As far as the south, rather than, could we put a foot number on it? Could we say that approximately 300 feet? Um, yeah, I have approximately two, 310 feet south of only Sandy Spring Road. Right. Approximately 300 feet. Could we, so if we said approximately 300 feet south of 108 on Meeting House and up to the entrance to Sandy Spring Museum on the north side on, on Bentley. And it, without objection. And I, and I ask these questions because I'm the one that's going to have to go back and rewrite it. So. <laughs> 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 All right. Thank you. Um, the next is uh, Halsey Road, which is a road that uh, departs from Route 27, uh, go heading to the east. This is north of Damascus. Um, you heard testimony from uh, Mr. Mr. Fleming. Uh, was in an area basically saying that there are uh, there are concerns about the narrow uh, width of the road and uh, fire equipment being able to service the area as well as um, uh, uh, traffic. You know, if there's any traffic on the road, there's not room for more than one car at a time, so one would have to pull over for the other coming on. Uh, those kinds of concerns are actually pretty normal for a rustic road, particularly for a very low volume road. Uh, however, he also pointed out that um, there is some desire in the community ultimately to have uh, sidewalks on at least a portion of the road where there are a uh, significant number of people living. Um, significant, still not being a very large number, but significant for a rural area, um, as well as possibly street lights in the area. Uh, not sure when either of those would happen in a road like that anytime soon. But in looking at the road um, in the field, and, uh, and you can look at the, again, the map on um, page 156. Uh, 156. Uh, what you see there is the rustic road designation from Route 27 uh, east to the end of county maintenance. Beyond that point, there's a driveway that goes to private farm. Um, you see the uh, rustic features really start about two tenths of a mile east of Route 27. You see where the the hedgerows begin, those little circles, and you see Inez Ziegler Maccabee House and you see the, uh, the scenic views. They're all east of the point, which is two-tenths of a mile east. And in fact, most of the houses, and in fact, there's an industrial commercial type of use right uh, at the corner of 27 and Holsey Road are not particularly rustic at all. So uh, uh, my recommendation here is that that first two-tenths of a mile be classified as a country road instead of um, a rustic road, but from that point on be classified as a rustic road. Um, I just point out that the um, uh, Rustic Roads Advisory Committee did meet on this and did actually change its recommendation and, and argued for it to be uh, a rust a, not be a rustic road. Um, and uh, Ms. Van Atten is here, she could perhaps, perhaps talk about it if you're interested. But uh, that's that's my recommendation, it's essentially kind of a compromise. It's first two tenths of a mile east of 27 would be a country road and then where the the, f the significant features start from that point to the east would be a rustic road. Uh, from a, I'll, I'll turn it over to Ma Councilmember Balcom, but from a practical perspective, uh, what does that do to uh, maintenance and general uh, uh, um, interaction when, when you're separating it by two-tenths of a mile? Well, the first two-tenths of a mile um, 
the whatever uh, what in, in terms of uh, expenditure for maintenance that that's really a budget issue but in terms of the what their executive regs talk about uh, for uh, rustic roads versus non rustic roads there really isn't a whole lot of difference um, the ba regular maintenance like clearing out culverts um, tree canopy cut back um, uh, if there's a pipe that's uh, that needs to be replaced onto the road. Uh, all that would happen whether it's a rustic road or not. It really more has to do with uh, if the roads can be reconstructed uh, at all. Um, it would mean that, it could mean that that first two tenths of a mile could be widened ultimately to a standard two lane uh, suburban street uh, or whatever, whatever the, the, uh, the uh, uh, standards are for a country road. Um, but the section east of there uh, would not be except for in a few maybe a few places if there's a safety issue uh, this is not an exceptional rustic road so it's not as nearly as strict as it would be uh, if it were that Councilman Balcom um, thank you so this is a question that I had for um, you know we'll talk about um, El Elton Road later uh, when we talk about maintenance but um, so there's no restriction or minimum road length and when you when you decide what the classification is so I'm I'm cons wondering about this road and it's a small road to be it's a small piece to begin with and then if we take away the 0.2 miles it, it I feel like that there's a um, it becomes um, more and more minimal as to what piece of the road we're putting into rustic my preference would be to not uh, consider this road to not classify this road as rustic um, and I think that because it's now only um, less than a half a mile so I just thoughts on the size of a road because we have a lot of tiny little pieces of roads in the rustic in the in the program so can can either planning or DOT or, or uh, Dr. Orlin talk about the size of the roads. Yeah, I think they're pulling up some information here to, I'm not sure off the top of our heads that we know a comparison in length to other lengths of road, but um, again, per the, the planning board recommendation, um, they did consider some testimony around this and uh, including that of the Rustic Roads Advisory Committee and ultimately determined that the length was sufficient enough uh, if removing this two tenths um, you don't really see can you point at least on this map so I'm, I'm aware exactly where you're speaking of Glenn yeah it's uh, if you look at page 156 you see where the hedgerows start yeah. it's basically at that point so from, from where Route 27 is to the point where the hedgerows start uh, it would be the would be just a country road and the rest of it from that point east would be the rustic road. So most of the road would still be rustic. Um, you're right though, uh, Councilmember Balcom, it'd be about half a mile uh, would be, um, be this. There are the rustic roads I know in here, I can't point them out off the top of my head, but there are that are shorter than a half a mile. Um, uh, right, there are quite a few that are, so I, so one is a curiosity question of how we determine whether a road is too small or it is no route road too small and then more practical question of whether this specific road given the um, the testimony that we heard from from uh, not only mr. Fleming but uh, also a lot of the uh, residents who live on the road that their hope is to someday improve this road well again that was my point of the Sort of compromise that most of the people who live on Halsey Road live in this first two tenths of a mile, mm -hmm. and the business that exists is on the first two tenths of the mile. Uh, beyond that, yes, there are a few houses, but they're, they're more spread apart. That's where the scenic views are, that's where the, um, the Maccabee house is. Um, and I, I, that's, well, I, I almost said I wasn't going to say this. It's like pornography. You recognize it when you see it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this has all the earmarks of a rustic road, particularly from that point east. Uh, there are vistas. 
uh, that are rural, there are, um, again, the hedgerows, there, uh, it, it just, d and it's a very narrow road, it's very little traffic mm -hmm. beyond that point because most people live west of there. Um, and so uh, it just seems like it, uh, it should be a rustic road compared to all the other roads we have in the program. Okay. Um, I, I will uh, s say that uh, the, the ma it, the, you don't have to designate a certain length or it doesn't have to be a minimum certain length to be a rustic road. And in fact, it, I just did a quick scan of some roads that are already in the program. Uh, for example, Hipsley Mill is a .36 miles and uh, Burdett Lane is about uh, .4 miles uh, so mm -hmm. there are roads that are under uh, that are like half mile length mm -hmm. and I'll just say quickly the significant features that were identified um, are mostly if not all still preserved with that alteration so in mm -hmm. I'll just say on the spot here it, it appears that the sort of the ultimate goal ultimately what was deliberated at least with the planning board would still be intact even with the small removal as, as suggested I'll just jump in and turn, and turn it over to Councilmember Stewart in, in saying that I, I, I think we're at an interesting crossroads here in which the Rustic Roads Advisory Committee is recommending one thing, uh, actually a declassification uh, of uh, Rustic Road when the Planning Board is recommending the maintenance of that Rustic Road. I'm going um, to side with the Advisory Committee here uh, and uh, not support the continuation of the Rustic Road for for uh, for Halsey Road, Councilmember Stewart. I think I was going to say basically the same <laughs> thing, and then just also raise that um, Councilmember Lukey um, also asked that this uh, be declassified as well, and, and for those reasons, I, I agree with Council President. Councilmember Malcolm. Okay. And Councilmember Malcolm, you're uh, that's unanimous in other words. Yes, thank yeah, you. I'm sorry. Uh, Got to keep score too here, so. Okay. I'm voting with my eyeballs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mr. Leggett did that for 12 years in the council, T and E. Um, uh, Ockard Lane uh, is a neighborhood street in the Cloverly area. It's a dead end street off of Holly Grove Road. Uh, it's also a narrow road. Um, uh, it was considered by the planning staff and the board, but ultimately not recommended to be a rustic road. Uh, the Rustic Roads Advisory Committee believes it should be, given its historic nature. And, um, uh, uh, it's a historic black community there, and it is a very narrow road. It has very limited traffic because it is a dead end. Um, the, um, uh, however, I'm concurring with the Planning Board on this one. Uh, one of the characteristics that's required, or one of the criteria that's uh, required, uh, is um, that it's located in a, the road is located in an area where natural agriculture or historic features are predominant, and this is the important one, and where master plan land use goals and zoning are compatible with a rural rustic nature or a rustic character. Uh, it's not. Uh, that road is uh, suburban. Um, it, uh, there isn't a rural zoning along there. Um, it's not like there's ever going to be a lot of redevelopment there anyway, but uh, it doesn't meet that particular criterion. Uh, and so as a result, I'm concurring with the uh, planning board not to classify Awkward Lane as a, as a rustic road. And can I just also add, um, this was discussed, discussed quite a bit with the board, and um, in addition to this recommendation, we pointed out that given the historic character of that community, that there are other means to recognize that, such as historic markers or other, other types of programs to acknowledge the, the, um, the importance of that community in terms of its um, African American history, um, but that can be done outside of the Rustic Rose program. Without objection. Yeah. Uh, the next item is um, uh, Bellsville Road and Old 100 Road, which is Route 109, particularly the section between Route 28 and Bellsville and, um, and I-270. Um, uh, it is classified as a rustic road now. Um, it has a lot of characteristics of a rustic road. Um, my recommendation in the packet was to uh, declassify this, make it a country arterial because of its functional, uh, its function is really a, is a road that carries uh, traffic from Poolsville effectively all the way to 270 and back. Um, uh, however, I've changed my mind since then, <laughs> so I'm going to tra track this recommendation. Uh, the general point I was trying to make again is that because it's a state highway, uh, we have no authority over it uh, in terms of maintenance or construction. And so I didn't want to, the, the plan to convey a false sense of, of uh, 
uh, to folks that we actually can do something to this road or, or can protect it from being approved if State Highway did, uh, wanted to do it. Uh, however, it doesn't hurt to have the road in there. Uh, we can continue to point out to State Highway that we consider this a rustic road and so to the degree that they make improvements or do certain kinds of maintenance along the road, uh, we would ask them uh, if they would follow the same rules that we would follow, which they can either uh, accede to or ignore, but uh, it does help to show the county's policy that this is something we consider as being as rustic. So a um, uh, long way of saying never mind. Um, uh, I'm glad you did a 180 on that because I, I agree with where you've landed and I think while our uh, jurisdictional responsibility might be minimal, if any, uh, having this listed as a rustic road signifies to the state how important we think it is. Uh, yes, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, uh, one, of the, one of the great things about um, community engagement is that the community really engaged with me on this in the past 24 hours, and so <laughs> I appreciate the, the calls, texts, and emails, um, and uh, the Rustic Roads Advisory Committee did an excellent job of rallying the troops, and so I appreciate that. Thank you. All right, the next uh, item um, are, are, has to do with a comment from the DOT's made about bridges. Um, of course, uh, all these roads, or most of these roads, do have bridges. Um, and uh, what uh, DOT is saying that a lot of the bridges uh, in, um, on these roads, particularly the exceptional rustic roads, are not particularly exceptional. They're, um, they're either more, a more recent vintage or they're not particularly architecturally interesting. And, um, they identify 24 um, uh, such bridges, um, and you see that in Circle 2 of the packet. Um, the, and uh, Tim is here to talk about that. Uh, my, my response is that really the fact that a, a bridge might be narrow uh, doesn't, uh, even if it's newer or not particularly interesting architecturally, doesn't in itself not make it uh, significant, which is sort of a triple negative there, I think. Um, the, the executive regs does, do allow for uh, bridges, even on exceptional rustic roads, to be widened. And the language I point to is the middle of page five. Um, it, this is the particular criteria from the executive reg, and it says that an existing deck of a, of a bridge on an exceptional rustic road um, uh, can't be widened unless improvements are specifically needed for the transportation of agriculture-related equipment in which case the new or rehabilitated deck should be no wider than the existing approaches. Um, well, we're not, and what's being asked for here is not to widen the road itself, it might be just to widen the bridge, um, and, but that can be done under the current regs, uh, as long as it's not being widened any wider than the approaches themselves. Um, the issue sort of comes to a head now and then with regards to funding, because uh, Federal aid is available to a certain degree on bridges. It's parceled out by the state, but it's federal funds. One of the requirements is that to get federal funds, the bridge has to be at least 20, foot long, 20 feet long, and depending on the traffic volume, uh, has to be a certain width. It varies. Um, and the federal uh, contribution is certainly well more than half of the cost of these bridges. However, the council in the past has, uh, in, in at least one occasion I can remember, I think in a couple actually, uh, where the rustic road did have a one-lane bridge uh, and the decision was made you know it's going to cost us the county to widen that bridge if uh, if I mean, to replace that bridge with another one-lane bridge that might be structurally sufficient uh, but we're willing to do that to maintain the rustic nature of the road that happened with white ground road about 10 years ago uh, south of Boyd's um, and so the opportunity is there and in terms of the federal aid, in my experience with federal bridge aid is that um, there's plenty of other bridges that the county can use that federal aid for. It doesn't have to be for um, a situation like white ground. Uh, so um, I don't think we're really losing out on any federal aid by, 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 uh, by this. So uh, my recommendation is not to change the significant features in the plan regarding bridges. Leave them where they are. And Tim is here if he wants, if you'd like to hear from DOT about this. I think we're all good oh. with the recommendation. Oh. Thank you, Mr. Couples. Okay. Um, the last comment on 
the pl um, actually the uh, what's in the plan itself. Uh, DOT made comments about the road and lane widths. They point out that in some cases uh, the road width is uh, narrower than it really really is because the uh, their foliage has grown across or over the um, the pavement in, in some cases. Uh, and pavement markings themselves that are noted in the plan may be revised for safety reasons. Uh, so what they, they recommend is that uh, whatever references there are to road and lane widths be noted as tentative. Um, I agree with the intent, but I think the word is wrong. I think we really should be saying approximate. Um, so I, w I would recommend that the plan be changed to make reference to the fact that these uh, road and lane widths be um, uh, noted as approximate as opposed to a specific. And can I ask a question? Um, does that mean just an explanatory sentence prior to the road profiles or do we go to every single table for every road and put the word approximate? Uh, the former, I hope. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah, an, uh, an overarching statement. Yeah. We're going to try to keep this resolution as short as possible. <laughs> okay. Um, as pointed out earlier, the, the really the big issue that was raised during the public hearing, uh, and actually the hearing on the, the bill even, um, that you're talking in minutes, has to do with maintenance. Um, and so uh, what's included in the packet here are, first of all, um, uh, Councilmember Balcom uh, staff raised a few questions and DOT's provided answers here on the middle of page six, uh, having to do with uh, how our priorities decided uh, are rustic roads treated any differently in terms of resurfacing and tree trimming? And um, is there a height standard for trimming the rustic roads? Um, and th that's here. Uh, and also they've included uh, a very long uh, PowerPoint presentation which describes all the work they've been doing on rustic and exceptional rustic roads for the last seven years. Um, Richard Dorsey uh, couldn't attend the meeting. Richard's the director of the uh, uh, chief of the Division of Highway uh, Services, but Jeff Knudsen, who is basically in charge of this work uh, is here and um, I ask him to if one, one of the folks here can give up their their seat and have Jeff come up um, to talk about maintenance since we're really not so much talking about the plan anymore. Jeff is here I'm, I've been tasked to try and oh, okay. represent DOT and I'll do the best I can I'm you know uh, I'm somewhat familiar with some of the maintenance things and then I'll phone a friend okay. if I need some help. Um, so I guess this is the time I'll turn it over to Councilmember Balcom. I'll get my recommendations out. Uh, you want to turn your microphone on, Dr. Roland? Oh. Sorry, I'll make my recommendations and leave it and turn it over to the discussion. Uh, one is that uh, over the course of the next year, DOT um, uh, work on reevaluating the executive regs, which also have not been updated comprehensively in 27 years. Uh, engaging planning board, but also stakeholders, Rustic Goods Advisory Committee, Agriculture Advisory Committee, and others, uh, to really take a fresh look at all of this, especially in this case the maintenance requirements um, uh, in the regs. And, uh, and in terms of tracking the amount of work that's done, uh, we really don't know, at least publicly, how much work is being done in terms of dollars on rustic roads and uh, rural roads in general. And so I make three recommendations. One is that in the next CIP, we split the um, resurfacing residential rural roads PDF into a resurfacing residential PDF and a res uh, resurfacing rural roads PDF. So you can have a beginning of a tracking over time as to how much money is, is spent on each. And that the council can decide, we want to increase the amount of spending on the rural road resurfacing. Same thing's true with the um, residential and rural road rehabilitation PDF and CIP. Uh, split that into two, two separate PDFs, one for residential, one for rural. And finally, in the operating budget, uh, where we have programs uh, listed and uh, uh, basically separate out the maintenance that's done on rural roads so that, again, we can keep track of that. And the council will have the opportunity to say it wants to add money or change the amount of money in that. Um, with that, uh, I'll turn it over to to any questions you have or um, do you have anything else you want to add, Mr. Yeah, I, I think um, just want to point out, you know, DOT provides the same level of service on, on all roads. I mean, we have different pots of money, but we do provide the same level of service. I think it's in, in, important to note, you know, the in, in structure, infrastructure maintenance task force um, that we do periodically, you know, kind of documents the need versus the funding and the, the need far outstrips the funding. Um, but, um, you know, the only you know, 
the only difference that, that in terms of maintenance that a rustic road gets is um, one, we have to work with the significant features, right? So that, that's something that we work with Rustic Roads Advisory Committee and, you know, in the course of our maintenance activities, um, you know, we will, um, you know, consult with them. They're, they're very helpful, especially on, on, you know, the tree trimming and stuff like that. Um, one difference with regards to the tree trimming that uh, we do differently versus on, on a rustic road versus on, you know, maybe a, a suburban road or, or a road elsewhere, you know, when there's a clearance problem um, on, a, on a road anywhere else in our inventory, we just go address that one particular tree because it's a specific complaint. On the rustic roads, because um, we're getting these, uh, you know, primarily uh, complaints about the clearances um, from the agricultural community, we're going to go look at a segment and we're going to kind of do the part that needs to be done all at once and we'll, we'll work really closely with the Rustic Roads Advisory Committee on the tree trimming. Um, there are, you know, we, Glenn I think touched on it, there's, there's different height standards that, that we would use to, to make sure the agricultural uh, equipment can pass versus what we might provide on, on a suburban street. Um, you know, the only other thing I, I would point out is, you know, with, with you know, the packet and Glenn's suggestion that we track and separate out the, the budgets differently. I think we can do that easily on the capital side. That, that's something that, piece of cake. We can do that on the tree maintenance side because of the way that we do that. O on the operating side with our depots, you know, we, we have a depot and they may go out and they're working in multiple locations in a day and we don't have the capability on the operating budget you know, if we're going out and filling in a pothole or cleaning out a, a, a storm drain, I, I don't know how I could give you that information on the operating budget side, but we do have that ability on the capital side and on the tree maintenance side. So th those are just kind of the, the, the key things I wanted to mention for your consideration. Um, one of the things I'd add is when I talk about splitting this out, when I talk about rural roads, it's a, it includes not just rustic and exceptional, but all rural roads. Um, because I think the concerns that have been raised about maintenance has to do with really all of them, not just rustic and exceptional rustic. The rustic and exceptional rustic may have some of its own additional concerns because of the executive regs uh, that apply to them, uh, particularly the exceptional rustics. But um, for the most part, the concern has to do with how much money is actually being spent filling potholes, uh, cleaning out ditches, cleaning out culverts, um, tree trimming. Um, some of the agriculture equipment are, tri are driving on roads which are in rural areas, but they're not rustic or exceptional rustic, and they need the same kind of treatment, so. Um. Thank you, so uh, when, we st when we first started looking at the, the master plan, um, it became apparent very quickly that, um, of course, the master plan and the, uh, the additions and subtractions to the master plan were critical, and we've had lengthy discussion about the makeup of the Rustic Roads Advisory Committee. But overwhelmingly, the discussion has been on maintenance. And um, at which, um, you know, in practically doesn't, doesn't uh, fall into either one of these pots. Um, but the question, I understand that rural roads aren't treated differently um, in terms of priorities and, and fixing the roads based, I given that they have to maintain the rustic nature. But that's just not the perception. And so can we talk a little, and there's also the question of why are we adding more roads when we can't take care of the roads that we have in the rustic program? So I think that having the discussion, first off, I totally agree with pulling out um, the rural roads and residential roads from a capital perspective and operating if, if we could. I, I understand the, the depot issue, but I completely agree that that's a, a great start. But can we talk about um, the priority of, of when a road is uh, maintained or improved and um, the and how it gets on the list and I, I in reading I understand that it's the condition of the road puts it um, where the priority is, but is the, main, the condition of the road, is usage considered as part of that? And um, I understand that most of this is complaint-based, and so how does a road get on that priority list? 
so the we will do a, a pavement condition survey and we will develop a map that has the condition of all our entire network and then we will look to optimize the strategies on the basis of, of the most cost effective approach because sometimes an early intervention with a lower cost treatment can extend the service life of the asset um, much more cost effectively than than kind of letting it deteriorate and then doing a full you know resurface or reconstruction um, so I'm getting close to the limit of where I need to phone a friend <laughs> but in, in general um, you know it's, it's kind of like a mathematical process to kind of we, we, we're optimizing it um, we do also respond to service requests um, those uh, you know, for things like a pothole or, you know, kind of a, a spot condition where we need to go out and address something right away. That, that's outside of that, you know, pavement condition index calculation that we're doing. You know, the, the condition of the road at the time that we go through and scan it with the lasers and the cameras, that, that will really drive our, our cycle for, for resurfacing. Um, the, what was my, I cover all of your questions. I feel like I'm missing a part. Um, yes, the, the, when when you talk about optimizing, um, so how does a a one mile road uh, in Dickerson compare to a one mile stretch of road in the heart of Silver Spring, and if the condition of the road is similar, how does the one mile stretch of road in Dickerson move up the ladder? So I think, I think I'm confirming that usage is a factor there. I mean, we're right. trying to serve so, the most customers. <laughs> right, so here's, th that's, that's the crux of the problem mm -hmm. because rustic roads will never compete with roads with higher usage and so the the rustic roads will never get to the given that understand that we don't have the resources to fix every road across the county will never the rustic roads are, are always on the bottom of the list and so they're complaint based and um, even the complaint based nature of fixing the road um, they're at the bottom of the, back, at the bottom of the list because there aren't as many people riding on the road, so you're not going to get as many complaints. And so the process for maintaining the rustic roads just doesn't work. Um, and so I appreciate if we pull out rural roads, um, I know that that's not a one-to-one -one match, but it certainly helps, um, is, it has to happen. Um, but the idea that um, we, we have to maintain these roads and we, uh, I appreciate the Rustic Roads program. Um, I live, you know, I've, I'm in the up county. I use these roads all the time. Um, so I don't know what the, the solution is, but it, it's got to be different than what we're currently doing because um, it's, it's just simply not working. Um, I, I would like to hear more about whether the idea of pulling out the, the funding um, will help in that we can, then, then the one mile road in Dickerson isn't competing, hopefully, with the one mile stretch of road in Silver Spring. So how will that work functionally? I think it's, it's, it's difficult to kind of noodle through that right sitting before you I, I think there's there could be some some pros and cons um, one you you might be um, creating a, a certain pot of money where the rustic roads are just competing against each other but then you know if that pot of money isn't sufficient then we're a little hamstrung in in you know kind of going above and beyond that level of effort. Wouldn't this be similar to the BIPA program where there was uh, a pot of money for all bicycle and pedestrian improvements and then over the last number of years they were delineated based on geography? It is and that has there's some challenges with that because as you know costs have increased in recent years due to the kind of escalation we've seen with material 
and commodity prices and, and labor shortages and so forth. When it was all one BIPA, it was easy to kind of re, there was like a level of effort and it was easy to kind of reallocate funds to the one that we were working on right now and then we'll, for, we'll worry about the rest. It gave us some latitude um, that now if there is a specific BIPA, for example, like, you know, a, a Silver Spring BIPA or, or a Wheaton BIPA, where there's a set limit for that particular program and then I've got to come back and request an appropriation to kind of go beyond that. So th there's pros and cons, but it does inc improve the clarity of what are you getting for your money. The, the, the underlying, the, the underlying uh, fact is that whatever the system is now isn't satisfactorily um, maintaining these rural roads. And I'll, outside, even, even the rural roads outside of the rustic program. Um, I have a couple thoughts if I could. Um, one is that um, I know what uh, Tim's saying about to be able to track the maintenance, not the resurf the other kinds of maintenance other than resurfacing. But you know, frankly, I don't think any new system would go into effect until a year from now. And hopefully, there can be something to change in the documentation of the work that the depots are doing, which is signify what work's being done within the rural area and which what what work is not. Um, they basically draw a line and say uh, this is rural, this is not, uh, and, and you can then keep track of it. Um, I, I, uh, the other thing I want to mention, just uh, another thing I want to mention really quickly, uh, Tim mentioned the pavement condition index. Uh, my understanding is you still, you reevaluate that every two years, right? It's on a biennial right. cycle. So when they go around the county looking at the, the road surfaces, it's not old data, it's, it's at the most two years old. Mm -hmm. So it's very recent. Um, the other point I want to make, the last point I'll make, is that uh, in the resurfacing area of the CIP, we also have a PDF for primary arterial resurfacing. And we hold that to a higher standard in terms of um, how much money goes to that because those are the roads that are used more often. Uh, and they're used by heavier, usually heavier equipment as well, uh, vehicles as opposed to the traffic volumes. And it is frankly more important to keep those roads uh, resurfaced than the residential streets. Not the residential streets aren't important, but primarily are more important. It occurs to me that the, the rural area, these roads serve as actually both primary as well as local because a lot of the traffic is pretty long. Uh, and so uh, I think it does make sense to try to separate these things out and perhaps give more resources per, per mile, if you will, uh, not maybe not a ton more, but a bit more uh, for these rural roads than for the, uh, for the residential roads for that reason. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, I've got other questions, but we can go. Well, so just on this point, I, I think Mr. Couples uh, um, spoke to the situation we're trying to, to work through in that, uh, if we are to delineate these, uh, there clearly is a competition for resources as there is within the entire budget, understandably, uh, but there is a clarity of uh, where resources are going. Um, I tend to lean on, on the side of the latter, uh, and I think mm -hmm. that uh, the district council member, uh, this has been her clarion call throughout this conversation, mm -hmm. recognizing that we could classify any of these roads anywhere as whatever we want, but if there is no funding to maintain them, then the classification is for naught. And I appreciate her, her, her statements uh, to that effect. Councilmember Stewart. Great. Thank you, and I appreciate Councilmember Balcom raising um, these issues. And <clears throat> just to add another element, and I appreciate, Mr. Couples, what you're saying. Um, is it would also seem to me and correct me if i'm wrong here but that many of these rural um, and rustic roads they're not completely overlapped there are also roads that are very susceptible to the impacts of the climate crisis we have right now is that would that be an accurate statement regarding i, I don't know that i'd want to make a, a broad characterization but there are you know these roads generally, for example, um, the the 
drainage system, for example, it is not, there isn't an enclosed drainage system, or, or there may be swales along some of them, but some of them they're not because it's just a prescriptive right of way. And, and what that means is, you know, the right of way is only the width right. of the road surface. It's, you know, there's, uh, you know, on a, on a modern road, you have extra for the drainage system and things like that, whether that's a, a, an above grade drainage system or a below grade drainage system. And so, given the fact that the climate impact that we see in this area, um, you know, one of the significant impacts is probably more in free, more frequent intense rain events. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, that's what the data yep. indicates. Um, you know, I think you wouldn't be too far off in making a statement like that. Yeah, so I, I think I'm looking at a path forward <laughs> and how do we, or a road forward maybe, um, how do we address this um, particularly before our next budget conversation? Um, because I agree with Dr. Orland's suggestion of splitting out um, the CIP even if operating is a bit difficult and I'm wondering if this is a conversation that we need to bring DEP in on as well as we're looking at the the funding for the maintenance and the upkeep of these roads if there is an intersection between some of the work DEP is doing on increased flooding and mapping of that in our county because of the climate crisis and where these roads are. Um, and are there other funding sources that may be available in addition to what the county puts into our CIP? I'm just, I wanted to add that as we're kind of moving forward on that. And the other question I had is, you talked about the pavement condition um, survey. W what about the gravel roads? Because I think we have, how do they figure into the pavement, like, in that? So I, I may have to ask Jeff to come up, but I mean, gravel road maintenance is, is different. Obviously, you're not going to, th there are certain defects that you, you will see, like the washboarding or the rutting and things of that nature. The nature of the maintenance is, is you know, um, a little bit beyond my area of expertise to comment on. Jeff, I don't know, did you? Yeah. Why doesn't Jeff come up and okay. explain that in more greater detail? Okay. Good morning. I'm Jeff Knutson. I'm Chief of Field Operations with Highway Services. Uh, stepping back a minute to one of the questions. You could just speak up a little bit. More. Okay. Um, Thank you. I, I just want to touch back on something Tim said uh, where usage is a priority, but we are sensitive and do provide service to all parts of the county and we, we try to include every part during the seven years that was included in this package we've performed some level of paving on 25 of the rustic roads out of 107 that's a significant amount it's like anywhere in the county you can find a community to say we're getting neglected that the work is going on somewhere else we hear that from all parts of the county but we do make every effort to respond to the residents and the communities out on the rustic roads. Uh, as far as, and again, if it was ever broken down in a percent, I think there's a little more than 300 lane miles of rustic roads, and we have 5,400 lane miles of roads in the county. So it would be a challenge to break that out in percentages. As far as the gravel roads, we perform I believe there's about nine gravel roads out of the rustic roads and our crews visit them monthly, sometimes bi-weekly, sometimes weekly. It all depends on the storms and with it being prescriptive right-of-ways there's not always side ditches for the water to drain to and water gets trapped and vehicles ride on it and you get the ruts. So we also have, we're sensitive, we also apply dust suppressant because that's a big challenge with the rustic roads and we use calcium chloride and some roads that are out without any tree canopy they dry out quicker than others so we're constantly out there filling in ruts we just did a major project last year on river road that was a significant amount of funding for that so uh, what we do probably provide more maintenance to the gravel roads than the non gravel roads if that answers your question uh, and uh, uh, it predated uh, your time on the council, but last uh, last 
Last term, I requested an OLO report regarding climate resiliency uh, and its effect on our infrastructure. Mm -hmm. To the point you just raised, there is an OLO report that came out in April of 2021, uh, and as has been stated here, it says very clearly that uh, that rain uh, and water is our greatest threat. And so as it relates to our roads and our bridges, exactly to your point, uh, and I agree that we should have a follow-up conversation. Very good. Um, thank you. And, and um, uh, so one of the, I guess both of the roads that I wanted to talk about, Elton, Elton Road and ri the River Road piece, um, thank you for this, the, the service request uh, data. That it was really, um, uh, really great data to have. Um, so Elton Farm Road, which I'm sure you're, <laughs> you're, you're probably a lot more familiar with it than, than, than I am, right? Um, so it had 23 road repairs, which is almost three a year. And so I think this is an important, so one specifically to Elton Farm Road, but then a more generic question of at what point in the maintenance of a rustic road do you rethink whether this is the most cost-effective way to treat the road? I understand that that many of these roads were put in specifically because they were gravel roads and wanting to maintain the gravel nature of the road. But is that the best? Is that the best thing uh, for you know for the people on the road, for the cost-effectiveness, for the environment, and in specifically this Elton Farm Road? There's a lot of different opinions on that. It is a significant feature, the gravel road. Uh, Alton Farm Road happens to be on a hill. There's a large field that drains onto it. And besides the number of requests that you see us out there, uh, our Damascus Depot visits the Alton Farm at least once a week to check on it, see if there's rutting and whatnot. Our priority is to keep all the roads safe and that drives the level of effort for paving or addressing the gravel roads. So if this if this road was not a rustic road, what would you do with it? I, I would recommend tar and chip or And so I I just have to question whether I understand the that we want to maintain as many roads as we can in the rustic roads program. But I, I feel like there's got to be a point in time where we say that this, this specific road shouldn't be a rustic road. And what is the process for doing that? Well, again, uh, to change the classification is to change the master plan either right now or a subsequent master plan amendment, whether it's a specific uh, master plan for you know, up updating the entire program or certain particular roads, a special master plan, or uh, a plan for this particular area, which is, um, I'm not sure what this is, this Patuxent policy area, I guess. Uh, but it, it would have to be done as part of a master plan amendment. Mm -hmm. and, and so was this specific road looked at um, to determine whether it should stay a rustic road? Yes, it's, um, if you look at the, um, uh, the special, the in volume two, the dis discussion is on pages 104 to 106, um, and it gives the history of the road, the traveling experience, the environment, uh, and this is, a, is an exceptional rustic road, not just a regular rustic road, and you see the map on page 106. Yeah. And I understand that um, part of the road is paved and part of it is gravel. Um, is that correct? Yes, the first part is paved, uh, and like half of it, maybe. So the first half coming off of Howard Chapel Road is paved, and the, the, the back part of it is, is gravel. Uh, can I ask that um, our staff respond to your question in terms of the gravel and whether or not that's required to maintain its um, classification? Sure, thanks. Hi, uh, I would say that um, it doesn't matter really about the surface. Uh, per se as much. I mean, if it's a rustic road, it, it can, uh, or, or an exceptional rustic road, it could have either or surface. So just because of the surface itself, uh, that's not the only feature that's important to this particular road uh, to make it exceptional. 
so this road could be uh, tarred and chipped. It, it, it. Yeah, I, mean, I think you know, DOT in our review of it, and I think this would be consistent with the, the Rustic Road Advisory Committee. You know, we, we didn't see it was any change being recommended. We didn't complicate contemplate it. I think we would be supportive of of keeping it um, as it is. You know, there are there's only a few of these types of roads, and you know, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I understand the point you're trying to raise about you know at, at what cost. Um, and you know, I don't know if there's um, information that we could provide on what the investment is, uh, and maybe you might decide that that level of investment is worth it. Um, you know, but but I think DOT's position is that you know, consistent with the Rustic Road Advisory Committee, we didn't see a, a reason to make a change. I'm sorry, I will I will add a little little clarification. So the unpaved section was part of the designation for exceptional status. Uh, with the paving of the road, it could potentially change the exceptional status. Mm -hmm. So there would be that that nuance to consider as well. But uh, the, the, the horse has got to follow the cart's got to follow the horse. In other words, uh, if the regs say that uh, you, for exceptional rustic road, you keep the surface that you've got, then the first thing that have to change is the classification. Um, unless it was one of those things where you know and they're not going to do this, but DOT went out in the middle of the night and paved it, and it became de facto something that was really uh, not exceptional anymore, and then the next time the plan would be updated, uh, it would be rusty. But they're not, they, don't, they don't do that kind of stuff. <laughs> so Especially I guess, not in the middle of the night when you can't see what they're doing. Yeah, I guess <laughs> that, um, so in one sense, this is a maintenance discussion, right? But if, it, if we can't, um, if if at the end of the day you can't uh, change this, the nature of the road being the gravel road without a master plan, uh, a change in the master plan, the master plan is now open and should this road be changed from uh, exceptional to, to rustic? Because if it's, if it's a rustic, and this is a question, if it's not an exceptional road, uh, then could it be uh, improved through tar and chipping? I, I think one of the things we would need to consider, and, and the reason why you're hearing me some hesitancy on the part of the, the executive staff is that would take a, a pervious area and make it impervious. And I don't know the stormwater management component of it yet because I haven't put any thought to it, mm -hmm. but it, it would be entirely consistent with the regulations that you might have to do more than just resurface the road. You might have to treat stormwater management in order to make that change. And, and I just don't know enough sitting here before you right now to kind of give you a, a complete picture uh, on which to, to, to you could hang your hat on to make a decision. So I appreciate that. And, and um, we can move on. However, I think that this is a, a, a larger issue of um, we have to, you know, not let the perfect be the enemy of the good in terms of we have this ro great Rustic Roads program and we also have th this road that just simply isn't, um, uh, there doesn't seem to be a fix for this road, and I I, I appreciate the you know the testimony of the, of one of the gentlemen that lives on this road that it's this, and the fact that you go out once a week. So if we're talking about this road is uh, not even a mile long, and the resources that it takes for DOT to uh, maintain this road just seems outsized in terms of what should be happening with this with this road um, to put a number on this uh, on page on circle 51 the last page of the packet uh, is the um, breakdown of the program budget for uh, DOT's general fund both in FY 23 and for FY 24 and about uh, a little more than halfway down there is an there is a line item other roadway maintenance says parentheses gravel roads and it shows an expenditure uh, in FY23 of uh, one point, or at least budget amount of 1.522 million. 
and by 1.611 million and at 1.2 million in FY24. Uh, I don't know if that's only for the kind of work that's done on gravel roads or if it includes some other things, but it does say gravel roads, so I don't know. Um, Yeah. Just want to offer that while they're looking. Uh, the currently, the road, the road was named rustic in 1996, and um, it just listed a, the unpaved road as a significant feature, even then. But at the end of the driving experience, and this is included in the new melt plan as well, it says this section of the road erodes frequently. So they, even in 1996, when they made it rustic, they knew that this was already a problem. The executive regulations, if it's rustic, say that the width, alignment, and road surface of rustic roads may only be altered to provide adequate safety, to reduce maintenance problems, to provide reasonable improvements, to allow for adequate vertical or horizontal clearance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, if it's rustic, it can be the surface can be changed to reduce maintenance problems. So, if that's an argument that is being made, then it's allowed. But our plan recommends it be exceptional rustic, in which case you wouldn't be able to. So I would recommend that this road be um, classified as a rustic road and not an exceptional rustic road to allow, given that we may not look at this for many, 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 many years, it gives, uh, it just gives leeway as to how DOT best should, should treat this road, understanding that stormwater management issues might be an issue and, and that funding might be an issue, but it just seems that this, this is a road that needs to, that, that given that when we look at the data, it's also um, one of the very few roads that has such a high road repair. So um, I would make that recommendation. And just restate the road? For that that um, the Alton Farm Road be um, reclassified as from an exceptional rustic road to a rustic road. Um, it, it already is a rustic well, road. That, well, that, that it not, not change. be changed yeah. to an exceptional. Yeah. Sorry, thank yeah. you. And, and the gravel surface is specified as a significant feature. Or in the old, in the old plan, it says unpaved road. We changed it to gravel road because it seems more specific to say it's gravel than to say it's unpaved. But um, the and this is where I think DOT runs into problems. Like, well, even though the regs say this, it's called out as a significant feature, so I, I'm wondering if the unpaved road needs to be reworded somehow. Yeah. Uh, I would think what, hap I th think what have to be reworded, in fact, one of the things you could say is that uh, a part of the road is unpaved. Cur part of the road is currently unpaved, because part of it's not, part of it is, mm -hmm. is paved. Um, but there, you know, there would need some rec be some recognition on page 104 of what you're, what you're saying. We can work with council staff to right. work out that language. Thank you. Um, I, I support the recommendation. Okay. Um, yep. Thank you. Um, and then the, the other road I'm sorry, I'm sorry, that I wanted to talk about. the committee just make a recommendation uh, to make that? It's unanimous. Yeah. Well, okay. um, the river road, you know, the asbestos, um, I know there's just a small amount of asbestos on the road, and I know that, um, that so that's another uh, road where would it have would it be treated differently if it weren't a rustic road uh, i'm sorry i missed the road the, the portion of river, river road river that road. has the um, asbestos on the road would that road have been treated differently if it were not a rustic road um i don't know if we could say right at this moment um i, I will say that it, at one point many many years ago uh, glenn maybe you remember this we did put surface course on a lot of our, our unpaved roads specifically to address that concern because um, it is a naturally occurring, uh, uh, it's not a mineral, What's it, it, it's <laughs> it occurs in, our, in, our, in the aggregates that, that are mined sure. in this area. Um, mm -hmm. It's a natural occurring substance, <laughs> that's probably, <laughs> so it is out there and, and we did resurface many years ago or, or apply surfaces many years ago to address that concern. Is there any plan now to do any additional work on that road? Yeah, I mean, we, we just completed uh, some major maintenance on it and, you know, we will continue to keep it up 
and, and continue to maintain. I think uh, Jeff mentioned some of the dust control activities that are occurring. Th those occur on that road on, on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. Um, and we're, we're always looking at the drainage, I think, is, is um, something that requires attention from us on, on a regular basis. We did right. uh, do a, a complete assessment of the drainage, and, and the highway folks did go out and address all of those as part of this rehab, and it's just something we'll, we're staying on top of. Mm -hmm. I think we got the, the most recent testimony we got that was that, you know, after a heavy rain, it, it kind of turned to mush. It, and that's kind of a function of the terrain as much as as the road um but uh yeah i mean we, we we are keeping an eye on that uh specifically because the the drainage report does recognize those okay. issues thank you i've got one last comment about maintenance um and then we can i think finish up um so this has to do with a recommendation that's in the master plan um uh, both uh, level of maintenance um, in the regs. And so I know that we're not talking about the regs today, but um, I just think that this is a critical issue. And that's um, the, there's discussion about, in the regs they talk about that the road needs to be safe for agricultural equipment and specifically calls out agricultural equipment. There is a recommendation that the regs be changed to um, safe for all uh, users, and I I think that the ag, the the ag equipment needs to be included in there. So I would I would uh, request that um, that that not be included in the master plan as a recommendation. That that change not be included for a couple reasons. the The, the issue is that uh, the roads have to be safe for agricultural equipment and I think that the criticality of the ag reserve and the reliance on uh, farmers and farm equipment uh, can't be taken out of that reg. Uh, page 53 and page 103 of the um, volume one. Um, but also safe for all users is um, I think uh, sets up an expectation that, uh, you know, does that include pedestrians and bicycles and which the, the roads are not safe for pedestrians and many roads are not safe for bicycles. And I don't want to set up the expectation because the, the nature of the road <coughs> can't change. We're not going to put sidewalks, we're not going to put bike lanes on these roads. Um, so for those two reasons, but primarily um, agricultural equipment needs to be uh, needs to remain in the in the reg. So I don't know if that's a, a planning board, a council staff, or a DOT. I'm sorry, I saw the reference to page 53. I, I apologize. What was the other page again? Uh, 103. The 103 is the reg. Um, oh, yeah. So it's page 53 in terms of the, yeah. uh, the recommendation. Um, I don't know. I think in terms of being safe for bikes and pedestrians, the the key is is speed. Um, it isn't so much the the width of the road. Well, it's not so much the width of the road. In fact, if you were to make it safer for bikers and walkers, mm -hmm. it actually widen the road. Um, but that would also encourage speed and also go against the uh, you know the, it would probably violate some of the significant features of that road. Um, I. I guess I would suggest instead I mean, leave this recommendation in, but say uh, in particular agricultural equipment. Just just highlight that, as opposed to saying not, not have it for all. Would that uh, would that work? Um, it it would solve the the biggest issue. Yes, um, it, because the biggest issue is that agricultural equipment must I, I think must remain in, in it. But I do think that. Um, I guess I guess we cross that that bridge that road when we come to it um, of what does it mean safe for all users and because pedestrians you know uh, regardless of how regardless of the speed I mean just the topography of the roads and the twists and turns of the roads I, I just think it might set up an expectation what safe for all means. 
the only um, sort of additional thought related to um, your recommendation with regards to um, bike use is that you know this is one thing to have bike lanes bike facilities but there are people who bike on those roads mm -hmm. even though there may not be bike facilities so perhaps uh, may I suggest we could work with Dr. Orleans to figure out a good way to revise this language mm -hmm. um, in, in order to provide a bit more clarification in time for the full council's consideration. Would that, would that work for the committee? Yeah, I, I'm, I, I'm okay with the, with the thank you, um, with the suggestion of, of all users specifically agric agricultural equipment. I, my, my main point is that we can't lose the phrase agricultural equipment. The broader point that that I appreciate you bringing up is you know, we're talking about roads, road uses, road design, and, and the purposes thereof. And in this very large county of ours, uh, not all roads are created equal, uh, and some have very specific purposes. Mm -hmm. And uh, appreciate you elevating that. Um, okay. Uh, I think we are. I'm the just end of this road. I uh, think so. Dr. Uh, could I just clarify, in terms of my recommendations on the bottom of page six, on uh, page seven, um, I don't know if the committee took a particular position on that yet. Um, again, are you, what do you think about the idea of requesting uh, a comprehensive executive reg, um, review of the executive reg, be ready for next year, and also um, splitting up the, the two PDFs and also in the operating budget having that? So the regulation, is that a method one or two? Method two. Okay. So we have this conversation again. Okay, great. Yes. Yep. Yep. And splitting up the PDFs, uh, much like we do with the BIPAs, yeah. Yep. And the operating budget as and well. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yes. Yeah, with that, I think we're done. Mm -hmm. This but item. I, is do those recommendations um, make the change to the plan itself? Or where would those be captured in terms it of would, this it wouldn't be, plan? It wouldn't be, these are, wouldn't be in the plan. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Let's be separate from that. Very good. Okay, uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Ms. Sindhu. Yeah, well, uh, planning, thank you very much for your work, uh, Director Stern. Just wanted to say we really appreciate the Teenies uh, Committee's consideration of this plan. It has been stated multiple times. It's been a long time since it's been updated. And so this has been a really great effort, and I want to uh, acknowledge all of our staffs, the planning department staff who's, who have done a lot of work working with all the stakeholders, including the Agricultural Committee, the Office of Agriculture, and the Rustic Rose Advisory Committee to provide these updates. And uh, we look forward to the full council's discussion of it. Uh, and, and, and I'll re-up the comment that Dr. Orlin made earlier at the beginning. Um, this is a, a, a beautiful uh, document. And for anybody who's following the conversations who wants to see where some of these roads are, uh, visit some of these roads. Uh, this is a very easy guide that explains it all. So kudos to you and your team. And so that is a unanimous committee recommendation in support <coughs> with amendments. And so now we are going to turn to Bill 3023, Rustic Roads Program, Rustic Roads Advisory Committee. With the planning department staying where they are, and Ms. Nadeau joining us. Any opening comments? No, we're good. Nope. <laughs> All right, good morning. So this is Bill 3023, which goes along with the master plan that you just finished. Um, this is a bill sent over the request of the planning board. And what this bill is going to do is make some of those Rustic Roads Advisory Committee changes you briefly discussed, um, mainly changing the number of members and then clarifying the additional duties. So some preliminary stuff. We had several speakers testify with varying degrees of support and opposition for the bill. And we also received all of our impact statements. So the climate assessment said no impact. The fiscal impact statement also said no impact, as did the economic impact statement. Um, but the RESJ impact statement did note that this could have a favorable impact, depending on what this new makeup of the committee looks like. So currently, the Rustic Roads Advisory Committee has seven members. So one of the 
main goals of this update or of this bill is to achieve two goals, which is increasing diversity and representation on the committee. So I'm going to do what ended up being sort of a line by line of this section of the bill. Um, and if it's okay with you, then I will pause after each line for the proposed amendment. So just going through the packet that way. Uh, so, f and I split it into two categories. One is the members and then one is the duties. So category one, increasing diversity and representation on the committee. So the first line is in making appointments, the executive should strive to achieve diversity on the committee. Staff's recommendation here is to change the word should to must. Yep, without objection. Uh, the second is changing the number of members from seven to nine. Um, and then next is removing the requirement that a commercial farmer um, owns the farm. So what it basically took out the word owner operator and just says operate. This way, if a full time farmer is leasing the land, they can still serve on the committee. Um, so next, this is a big category here. So the bill itself does not actually make any changes to the requ existing requirement that the farm, the three farmer members earn 50% or more of their income from farming. Um, we've received a lot of testimony on this piece on both sides. Um, specifically, well first I want to note that this requirement exists for APAB, which is the Agricultural Preservation Advisory Board, as well as for the Agricultural Advisory Committee, so that language is identical for all three. Um, during the public hearing, um, first the Montgomery County Farm Bureau um, had suggested that the members could include a letter from their accountant, because one question that came up is how are we actually verifying that these farmers are earning 50% of their income? Um, speaking to the Office of Agriculture, it sounds like generally we just know who these farmers are. There's only so many. Um, council staff's recommendation here is that it actually is, might be a good idea to figure out how we're determining this requirement, but you might as well do that across all three groups, in which case you could do that in a separate bill rather than making it different in this committee versus the other two boards. Um, thank you. Uh, yes, I I think that when uh, the income requirement needs to stay, we there was discussion about um, looking at whether we included commodity uh, commodity farmer. There was also a suggestion of whether we um, listed specific equipment. I know that both of those have advantages and disadvantages. Uh, what were your thoughts in terms of looking at those uh, suggestions? Yes, so the, I think it was, I'm going to start mixing the groups up and I apologize to all three of them. Um, I believe it was the AAC who had suggested adding the phrase with direct involvement in commodity farming and then the West Montgomery County Citizens Association disagreed with that and um, I think they had a footnote to the 2017 census that said of our thousand farmers, only 35 farmers would qualify for that. Um, and so staff's recommendation here as a few parts. One, the plan uses the term commodity farming a lot, as does this recommendation. That term is not actually defined anywhere in the county code. We all like t tend to know what it means. I think I use the phrase large scale farmers in here. But first, you'd have to actually define that term if you're going to put it in there, which is fine. Um, the council staff's understanding from when planning board proposed this bill is the intent of that requirement is to capture that farmers, um, that group of farmers, so this additional language may be unnecessary. I will note Councilmember Luki did submit a letter with um, her recommended amendments, um, and she also recommended including that phrase, direct involvement in commodity farming. So I guess I'm saying it's up to the committee. Yes. <laughs> um, so, um, thank you, and I think that the. Um, the the focus uh, for, from my perspective, it's the type, it, and I understand not, the, you know, the issue of um, it would be cumbersome to list the types of equipment, but but that really is the 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 impetus for large scale farmers or commodity farmers, and it's it is the type of equipment that's used um, on these roads, and it's important to have that voice at the table, um, so. I'm, um, I, I prefer to have commodity farmer included. Um, I would make a recommendation that we include commodity farmer. 
direct involvement in com commodity farming. I think that there's, um, uh, I guess we would have to come up with what that definition is, but the definition is used in other places that, um, that uh, we could come up with that definition. I, I couldn't, but <laughs> um, the broader community could. Thoughts? Catch my shirt. Um, thank you, and I appreciate all the feedback um, we got on this point. After um, looking at that, talking to, to folks, um, uh, you know, I, I'm fine leaving it just at the 50% the, um, the of uh, mm -hmm. their income, and overall, I, I, I don't think it is necessary to add the commodity farming, but appreciate the points. So. What I'm trying to reconcile is amongst the 90 plus committees, boards, and commissions, um, how, string, how stringent a guideline we apply to various uh, participants. Uh, I'm not fully aware of any other BCC in which there is that stringent a requirement. Are we, Ms. Nadu or anybody else, are we aware of any other application like this? I cannot think of any off the top of my head, but I can certainly double check for you. Yeah, um, you know, ultimately all of these, um, all of these boards go through a process where uh, participants are selected, usually self-selected within the the board itself. It goes to the county executive, and then it goes to the council for approval. There's enough. Uh, checks and balances that if something seems that it's out of balance, either the executive or the council can say so. Uh, and we understand what the intent here is, and the intention is to uh, have balance, uh, balance of views, um, and ultimately to make sure that we have roads that are rustic, remain rustic in nature, but remain functional. Um, in capacity, mm -hmm. and that's the balance we're trying to achieve. Um, and so, uh, I know the council staff does not recommend support for this amendment. I think that's what I'm hearing, Councilmember mm -hmm. Balcom state, and, and I support that. So that's two to one. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, and I um, council staff will work with planning and Office of Agriculture to define the term. Um, and that will be in the definition section, and then this section will have direct involvement in commodity farming, is what that draft will look like. So next part of this bill, um, one addition is gonna be to require the representative from AAC be recommended to the county executive by that committee. Um, that's not an amendment here, that's just in the bill. Uh, the next thing that the bill does is remove two members who represent civic associations. So previously it said one member who represents an association in the agricultural reserve and then another member who's outside the agricultural reserve but where there are rustic roads. Um, so following up with this, uh, the next big piece in this bill is adding three at-large members. So the intent of this was to increase the pool of who's eligible to serve and then help the county achieve its racial equity and social justice goals. There is a long list of examples in here, which I know there's been a lot of discussion about. Um, the examples are very illustrative. It shows small scale farmers, religious institutions, recreational users, agritourism businesses, um, and we received a lot of testimony about this. So first I wanted to note that from a legal standpoint, there is no issue with having examples in here. There's other parts in the code where there are examples, um, but I do know that there's been a lot of testimony about the policy reasons behind this, whether the list sounds too exhaustive or whether it should include more people or whether there's people in that list that you don't actually want on the RRIC. But council staff just wanted to say from a legislative attorney perspective, there's no issue with the examples being in here and that the examples can actually be useful in terms of showing what the council's intent was in having these three at-large members. And so the examples are inclusive, not exhaustive. Exactly. Okay. So in sort of legal interpretation, the word include always means it could go beyond this. So, If I can just add, um, again, Tanya Stern, Acting Planning Director, when we worked on this language, 
we were intentional about including these examples so that the intent of not only supporting more um, racial and ethnic diversity on the committee, but also recognizing that there are a wide variety of users um, of rustic roads. And so we wanted to provide this, these additional examples so that that uh, broader variety of potential, of the potential pool of people who can serve on the committee was clear uh, for the county executive, you know, for future appointments. But again, the intent was, was for the list to be uh, inclusive, but not uh, exhaustive. Um, this is sort of a starting point, but that there could be, you know, other types of users who could be uh, eligible for the committee. And uh, I, I was just going to say, again, reading it right here, examples of the at-large members include, I don't know if may include, right, is even necessary, but to allay any concerns. Uh, but it seems that the list that's there are a wide variety of people who are in our community who would probably use those roads. Mm -hmm. Um, so we've we've um, heard a lot of testimony about a lot of you know the master plan and this and it, this is one of those areas where everyone who's not everyone but most people who have commented the rest of roads advisory committee the farmers the the farming groups um, all recommend taking them out um, uh, I understand that it it's not meant to be exhaustive, but it could be perceived as pr prescriptive. It could, it could, um, uh, we could be lazy about just picking people who are in this list and not picking people who are out of this list. I, I recommend that we take the uh, examples out of the master plan, uh, out of this bill. Yeah, and I would just concur. I appreciate the effort, and it's always tricky uh, writing these things, but given the feedback we have had, which has been pretty overwhelming, um, as I like to say, when, when something gives a large number of people agita, we need to <laughs> be looking at it, and I think this description did that, and so I support mm -hmm. taking it out. Um, I'll support the, council, uh, the committee recommendation. So I'm going to jump ahead slightly, given that recommendation. Um, there was another recommendation to, instead of saying three at-large members to be drawn from other users of rustic roads, to change that to frequent users of rustic roads. And I assume if you're going to remove the examples, then you want that language change. Uh, okay. And that was the previous one that, yes. right, yeah. yeah. Amendment number six, uh, is that? Yeah, that was at the top of page seven. So yep. I was jumping ahead slightly since yeah, we yeah, go right, together. Right, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so now going backwards again. Um, so one of the, Major issues that has come up is whether the RRSA should be, RRAC should be more farmers or fewer farmers, and then whether it should be commodity farmers or small scale farmers. And there's a whole host of recommendations that go along with that debate. Um, so first, I asked planning for some data, and currently based on the mileage of all the rustic roads, about 76% are in the Ag Reserve, which as we know, is our area designated for farmers. I am aware that there are farmers outside of the Agricultural Reserve, but I thought that information is helpful in looking at the composition of the rustic roads versus the composition of the committee. So the three recommendations here were first changing that other users to frequent users, which you've agreed with. Um, the next is the AAC recommended actually pulling out one of the three at-large members so that you have two at-large members and then one member who is actively engaged in either table crop farming or agritourism. Because there's been a lot of testimony about making sure, yes, we have commodity farmers, but there's this other group of farmers as well who should be represented. Council staff agrees with that. Um, AAC's recommendation is to pull that from the at-large members. I know this is controversial and I'm not recommending it. I'm just throwing it out there that another option is you could pull that person from the three commodity farmers. So you have two commodity farmers, one um, agritourism or table crop farmer, and then three at large members still because you're trying to stay at nine people. So if, basically, if you want to add this required member, you have to take a member from one of the other two groups. I, I would be fine having that person come from the at-large, the three at-large. The way I, I, I agree with that, um, I think going from seven to nine, the, the question really is where are those two addition coming from, right? So one, we are, we're making one of those two new members an at-large member, 
but also we're now clarifying what that person will. Yeah. yeah, right, clar uh, and then the, the outstanding question is where is that other person coming from? But I'm good with this. Yeah, I think um, there's um, there there's a debate about about that. I know that um, I would I would be okay with leaving the three at large um, l more loosely defined as opposed to um, a tabletop cr a farmer, um, uh, but agree that I w I wouldn't want the tabletop farmer to come out of the three commodity farmers. Again, because of the just the significant importance of the equipment used, um, I know that the um, Rustic Roads Advisory Committee. I don't know if we've had formal statement on that. Their their, their preference, I think, is to um, keep it keep the three un um, unclassified. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that a tabletop farmer would be a significant asset to the Rustic Roads Advisory Committee. Um, I, I can go with the committee, the, my colleague's recommendation on that. It sounds like there's a committee recommendation. Uh, yes. Um, uh, Jamie Pratt, for the record, I, I'm, I'm not sure, well one thing about the agritourism operators, they, um, they're already farmers. Um, however, the table crop farmers, I mean, they might be farmers, but they're not um, making a huge living from it. So I think it's kind of, they're not quite the same category of farmer. Mm. Um, and I also uh, don't know how many there are. Um, I don't know, there's, I've, only, I've heard there's only like eight or 10 agritourism operators, but I, maybe there's 20, 30, 40. I don't even know how to categorize that, but I, I do worry that we might create a category that doesn't have enough people to pull from. So you, that was the question I was just going to raise. Um, you know, you, you, you made two points. One uh, about the differential, uh, differentiating the types of farmers, and we, we understand that, trying to be inclusive. Mm -hmm. uh, but I too share concerns about uh, the more specific we are, the, uh, the smaller the pool might be. Um, it's yeah, I, I get it. Yeah, I, I, th I think that's a really important point um, because we don't want to set up a situation where we can't find that um, that person or there's, uh, mm -hmm. it's a much smaller group. So is there a way that uh, in this amendment we can say with preference to or weighing weighing the scales a little bit, you know, being someone who is a table crop? So it could say, because it's coming from the at-large, we could say three at-large members to be drawn from frequent users of rustic roads, and then add a line that says that the executive should strive to include a table crop farmer or member of the agritourism business, so sort of combine them. Okay. Yep. Sure. Yep. There you go. Unanimous. Thank you. Okay, and then the last recommendation actually for the uh, committee makeup is uh, the way the bill was originally drafted, it said the three at-large members should be other users. That's now been changed to frequent users, but one thing council staff had recommends clarifying is that those three at-large members shouldn't duplicate the requirements above because otherwise we're not actually increasing representation on the committee. Yep. Makes sense. That. So lastly is clarifying the duties of the committee. Uh, so there are three main changes being made here. The reason being the RAC actually has additional duties that are codified in other sections of county law. So first in chapter 50, which is our subdivision chapter, and then in the executive regulations. So it's basically pulling those requirements and making sure they're reflected here based on other actions the council has taken. Um, so first is providing comments on subdivision applications um, when the rustic roads are involved. Um, providing comments on proposed improvements to rustic roads and then on proposed signs within the right-of-way. Those tend to be like, this is a historic site, those beautiful types of signs. Um, I know there has been some testimony recommending removing additional duties so that the committee doesn't have additional duties, but the truth is these are duties they already have, they just weren't written in here. So council staff recommends leaving all of these in. 
So say that last part again, their duties they already had but weren't? Yes, so their duties that the committee already had that weren't listed in this section of the county code but are found in other places in the county code. So just making sure that it's all in one place. And, <laughs> right, and so just being very clear that this is not adding to the committee's workload. Correct. It is just codifying the work that is was done. already expected was, of them. Okay. Uh, thank you. My, my question is that um, if it's covered in the executive regs, um, is it necessary to be in the bill? So I guess, so another way to phrase that would be if we don't put it in here, would they still have to do those yeah. duties? My answer would be yes, they would still mm -hmm. have to do those duties. Um, and um, so we're in the process, we, we've, at, we've in the past, in the prior discussion, we just asked that the regs be updated and it makes sense to have a thorough review of the regs. Um, my concern, if we codify the, this list here in this bill and then within the next year we go through the regs and, and either that's changed, uh, added or subtracted, then we're not, uh, then we have to come back to the bill if we're going to do that. Um, is it possible to, um, well so one, just if it's in, if it's in the executive regs, there, those regs dictate what the um, advisory committee does, so we don't need it, or some statement under the duties that says something like other duties as required by the executive regulations. So that way when the regulations change, the bill doesn't have to change. Or, um, I'm just concerned that when we get into the regs, if the regs change and we've codified it in the bill, there has to be a change. Um, I was going to start by saying that I agree with that recommendation to say other duties as found in county code, but Glenn ran up here, so I'm guessing he has something to say. <laughs> well, the, 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 exec the executive reg has to do with the construction, the uh, uh, maintenance and construction on rustic roads. It doesn't deal with the advisory committee at all. So unless in the review of the uh, of the executive reg that was added as a subject, uh, it wouldn't be covered in the executive reg anyway. Well, uh, looking at it, it I says the executive regulation says that the committee would review and provide comments on proposed improvements to rustic roads and review and provide comments on proposed signs within the right of way oh. of rustic road. Oh. That's on page eight of the packet. Okay. I didn't now, I'm the sorry, question I, is, I, take it back. I, I didn't realize that was in there. The, the committee already does this, right? Um, right we, are, do. we are very fortunate to have more than 90 boards, committees, and commissions that share their thoughts with us on, you know, a lot of different things. And so uh, I, I agree with the prudent approach that if we are going to take up the regulation and, and perhaps change some of that, then we don't want to come back and change mm -hmm. the oh, underlying nice. law. Yeah, Mr. Prime. Uh, hi, thank you. Um, right now in Chapter 49, there's a very specific list of four duties that the Rustic Roads Advisory Committee must perform. Um, the ones that are in the executive regulations um, aren't the same, uh, aren't as high as, as what would be in the code. So I would think that you would want the code to specify that they would review and com provide comments on proposed improvements to Rustic Roads and then the regulations would follow that so I would think that it would be important because that's kind of like one of the primary roles that I see the rustic roads advisory committee is having is if somebody wants to make improvements to a rustic road well who else who, who better to, to answer that and <coughs> the fact that that's not included as one of their specified duties in chapter 49 I well, think is, is a little bit troublesome so, so the amendment specifies uh, that the committee would review and provide comments on subdivision applications when the requirements of the subdivision regulations conflict with this article or executive regulations. Is the concern that, is the concern with subdivision applications, is that? Uh, that, that one was just, um, this, this whole 
section is just my attempt of looking at these four listed duties in chapter 49 and saying, well, that's not all they do. Well, well, and so this one is elsewhere in, chap in county code, so I'm not as concerned with it. Well, so going, going back to uh, Councilmember Stewart's technical term, what's causing agita? <laughs> You know, with incl I mean, with including it, you know, codifying it. If this is work that is already being done, it's something we expect of all the boards, committees, and commissions. And quite frankly, providing comments is what people sign up to these committees for. I would suggest uh, perhaps uh, with these two, number one and number two, one relates to um, section 50 of the code related to subdivision regulations, and then the other relates to the executive right the. Uh, executive regulation changes. I think we understand the comments related to uh, if the executive regulations are going to be updated, do we want to specify changes here? I would recommend treating that differently than uh, including um, the duties that are under Section 50 and Section 49 because that's a separate matter and I think the, the overall intent was to make sure that um, Section 49 just captured um, you know, essentially what the committee is, is responsible for in one place, um, while the executive regulations, as I understand it, you know, will go into a lot more details and that can be updated separately. But basically, I would suggest treating the change in number one and the change in number two separately, just given the conversation, if, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So how about for to combine the executive regulation requirements, but also account for the fact that th they might change. Although it is true that if you put this in here, then that might actually guide the executive regulations. But you could just say to review and provide comments as required by the executive regulations. Yep. And then no matter okay. what happens to yep. them, we don't have to deal another bill. Yep. Wonderful. Yep. yep. And that is all for Bill 3023. Uh, again, with, with respect to uh, those clarifying amendments, understand the intention uh, and, and appreciate planning board, uh, planning staff uh, and the board for wanting to uh, state them uh, more definitively, but I think we've landed in the spot. And uh, for the seven current members and the soon-to-be nine members, we expect their robust uh, engagement and communication. and. As Councilmember Balcom alluded to, texts and emails uh, as well as these issues come up. But um, I think we're all good with this amendment. Yeah. Uh, is, yes, so thank you. I, I would like to thank the, certainly the planning board for their work on this and um, for their engagement with the community and, of course, council staff. Uh, but primarily, I, I want to thank the community. Um, this is it, it's great to have such community involvement. And I appreciate the members of the uh, Rustic Roads Advisory Committee uh, for their diligence and, and not only the work that you do day in and day out for the program, but the, the work that you've done on both the master plan and the, this, this bill. So thank you. And of course, uh, thank you to our ag community, um, all, all of whom are here today. So yeah. thank you all. I just want to also extend my um, my thanks to everyone who took the time to review this it, and again just to reiterate the excellent work um, by the planning department and really it, it was it was a complicated issue but the documents the plans that you gave us were very clear uh, and made it very easy to go through and I do thank the members of the uh, representing the Ag Reserve um, as well as our farmers and our residents for all their engagement on this so thank you very much. My colleagues have said it well. Uh, this really was a, a, a full, fully engaged conversation, uh, and we've worked through it. And, and the fact that this hadn't been taken up since 1996, a big undertaking. Um, but um, I think we've landed in a really good spot. So again, thank you to the planning department. Thank you to the planning board. Um, and Ms. Nadu, thank you. Thank you to everybody. OK. Oh, more. One more item on our agenda today
Thank you, everybody. Uh, third and final item on our agenda today is a work session on Bill 2823, Taxation Fuel Energy Tax, the Green Bank. Um, and the reason this committee uh, recommended and introduced this particular bill is because a few months ago when we passed a bill expanding the Green Bank's authority to engage in resiliency efforts uh, to help further mitigate climate change. We wanted to make sure that the funding that goes towards the Green Bank, specifically the energy tax funding that was approved in the last council, uh, is remains dedicated to that purpose. And so we wanted to uh, introduce this piece of legislation to uh, safeguard uh, those funds uh, recognizing that the resiliency work uh, would be garnered uh, through uh, additional financial resources, um, specifically through federal grants and, and other opportunities. But again, we did not want it to uh, be, uh, be done at the expense of the uh, infrastructure work that came from the energy tax. And so I know that there is some uh, disagreement about the need for this, uh, but Ms. Sacconi, uh, if you want to walk us through the intricacies and the conversation, go for it. Uh, good morning, Council President. Thank you, and uh, good morning to the whole committee. Uh, so thank you so much for that background. And uh, actually, uh, I, I will start where you know you said there is disagreement. There actually now is agreement. The, the, it's, well, the the Office of County Attorneys, the County Attorney's Office had raised the fact that this may not be necessary, and uh, I had a, a fruitful discussion with them. The reason staff was recommending this is that the provision that says that 10% of the fuel energy tax goes to the Green Bank already existed in two separate places. It exists in the taxation chapter as well as the environmental sustainability chapter. So when we did do the the um, uh, Green Bank revisions in the spring, we only added the caveat to the environmental provisions and not to the taxation provisions. We actually do agree that it's not entirely, you know, it's not, it, it's not, um, this is more like a, I, I, I was describing it as a belt and suspenders. If you already have the provision in two places, you really should clarify the caveat in both places. What is more typical is that you would have this kind of provision in just one location. So um, in, in that regard, uh, Mr. Latner, uh, while acknowledging it's not, you know, maybe not essential, but understood the, the need and, and uh, we are in agreement on that now. That's good. Good job. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I did want to just mention, I, I should highlight the impact statements. The Office of Management and Budget estimates that this bill is not expected to uh, impact county revenues or expenditures. And then uh, the Office of Legislative Oversight anticipates that there will be minimal impact on the county's contribution. Uh, uh, sorry, there will be a, a minimal positive impact on the county's contribution to uh, addressing climate change. And then OLO also says that uh, there's an insignificant short-term impact uh, on the economic conditions in the county and stated that the RESJ statement uh, was indeterminate. So uh, moreover, and just to clarify, you know, if anyone, if there's any lingering question, why didn't we do this the first time around? It's because in the taxation chapter, there are very specific um, publication requirements. It should be published, you know, three consecutive weeks in, in a newspaper of general circulation. By the time this came up in that context, we had already missed the opportunity to publish it as a tax law. We were so focused on it being an environmental sustainability law. Uh, so doing it this time around, we're able to publish it as a change to the tax law as well. I, I appreciate that background. Um, I will just state for the record that while the um, uh, ResJ impact statement says that it would have an indeterminate impact on racial equity and social justice, uh, I would argue that this bill has a positive impact. And the reason for that is the 10 percent that we the 10 percent of the energy tax that is going to the green bank has a 20 percent um, requirement or requires that 20 percent be used 
in uh, our impact areas. And if there were funds that were transferred uh, away from that goal, um, then it would negatively impact our racial equity work here. Mm -hmm. uh, and the fact that the Green Bank during the budget conversations told us that they were exceeding the 20% requirement, and I think they're at 23% somewhere around there, we want to maintain that. We want to keep that going. And we want to make sure this funding is dedicated towards those efforts. So this bill codifying it does promote our racial equity and social justice work and just wanted to state that for the record. Uh, anything else? We're not seeing anything else. This is an <laughs> easy one. Yeah, It go is ahead. the easy one and lastly actually uh, I see the last two items on the agenda had a large party and then here I am pretty lonely. <laughs> so I did want to acknowledge that you know this is a follow-up item and Mr. Stan Edwards was tremendously helpful when we worked on this bill in the spring as well as the CEO uh, and COO at the Green Bank. So I did not invite them back simply because we got their input the first time around, uh, but I did want to acknowledge their work on this. We appreciate uh, CEO Morell. We appreciate uh, Mr. Edwards. Uh, we appreciate you. Don't, don't mis misinterpret the lack of an audience <laughs> for uh, lack of support. This is extremely important, uh, but it is very straightforward. It just means that you're much more efficient. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> well, thank you very much. And persuasive with the county attorney also. So I'm gonna I'm gonna call you next time yes. I have disagreements with the county attorney. Yeah. No, they uh, certainly were raising a very. I, sh I I need to be clear. They were raising a valid you know point, but we we were able to work it out. Understood. Very good. Uh, well, all those in support. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that is unanimous. Uh, thank you, Mr. Coney. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and with that, we are adjourned.